Hello. Sandy Shellis from Environmental Coffee House. Today, beautiful Sunday, beautiful, beautiful Sunday afternoon. And I am coming to you with an article by a really neat scientist that I had come across last year. And uh, her name is Kate Marvel. And she's a climate scientist and a science writer based in New York City. She's an associate research scientist at NASA Goddard Institute for Space Studies and uh, climate, uh, Columbia Engineering's Department of Applied Physics and Mathematics. And she writes regularly for Scientific American in her column called Hot Planet. And uh, I like her. I hope I'm, I'm going to be able to get her but to come on and, and uh, do an interview with us. She, uh, her current research centers on climate modeling to better predict how much the Earth's temperature will rise in the future. So, hi Kim. Okay, people are joining us. That's cool. But she's really cool. And she, she's had a lot of different uh, types of things. And the work led her to investigate the effects of cloud cover on uh, modeling rising temperatures, which has proved an important variable in climate models. So th that's not what we're going to talk about, actually. Um, oh, look, Duane Custer's with us, too. Hi, Duane. I'm going to read you these articles. Now, she, last year, I published one that she uh, wrote about we should never have called it Earth, it was called. And it was really good. But that's not the one I'm going to read today. Actually, I republished We Should Never Have Called It Earth on the Facebook page. And uh, you see I'm wearing my neck brace again today because it hurts to talk and I've been, I did too much. So I'm kind of like um, already, <laughs> already going backwards. So I need to go backwards and to go forward. So let's start this and then we'll have a little talk because she's cool. And I am going to get in touch with her. This article is called We Need Courage, Not Hope, to Face Climate Change. You know, we talk a lot in, the, in this genre about hopium. Well, she says, as a climate scientist, I am often asked to talk about hope, particularly in the current political climate. Audiences want to be told that everything will be all right in the end. And unfortunately, I have a deep seated need to be liked and a natural tendency to optimism that leads me to accept more speaking invitations than is good for me. Climate change is bleak, the organizers always say. Tell us a happy story. Give us hope. Well, the problem is, I don't have any. I used to believe there was hope in science. The fact that we know anything at all is a miracle. For some reason, the whole world is hung on a skeleton made of physics. I found comfort in this structure, in the knowledge that buried underneath layers of greenery and dirt lies something universal. It is something to know how to cut away the flesh of existence and see the clean white bones underneath. All of us obey the same laws whether we know them or not. Look closely, however, and the structure of physics dissolves into uncertainty. We live in a statistical world in a limit where we experience only one of many possible outcomes. Our clumsy senses perceive only gross aggregates, blind to the roiling chaos underneath. We are limited in our ability to see the underlying stimuli that en masse create an event. Temperature, for example, is a state created by the random motions of millions of tiny molecules. We feel heat or cold, not the motion of any individual molecule. When something is heated up, its tiny constituent parts move faster, increasing its internal energy. They do not move at the same speed. Some are quick, others are slow. But there are billions of them, and in the aggregate, their speed dictates their temperature. The internal energy of molecule motion is turned outward in the form of electromagnetic radiation. Light comes in different flavors. The stuff we see occupies only a tiny portion of a vast electromagnetic spectrum. What we see occupies a, a tiny, tiny, tiny little part. Light is a wave of sorts, 
And the distance between its peaks and troughs determines the energy it carries. Cold, low energy objects emit stretched waves with long, lazy intervals between peaks. Hot objects radiate at shorter wavelengths. To have a temperature is to shed light into your surroundings. You have one. The light you give off is invisible to the naked eye. You are shining all the same, incandescent with the power of a 100 watt light bulb. The planet on which you live is illuminated by the visible light of the sun and radiates infrared light to the blackness of the space. There is nothing that does not have a temperature. Cold space itself is illuminated by the afterglow of the Big Bang. Even black holes radiate, lit by the strangeness of quantum mechanics. There is nowhere from which light cannot escape. The same laws that flood the world with the light dictate the behavior of a carbon dioxide molecule in the atmosphere. CO2 is transparent to the sun's rays, but the planet's infrared outflow hits a molecule in just such a way to set it in motion. Carbon dioxide dances when hit by a quantum of such light, arresting the light on its path to space. When the dance stops, the quantum is released back to the atmosphere from which it came. No one feels the consequences of this individual catch and release. No. So she says more CO2 molecules mean a warmer atmosphere and a warmer planet. Warm seas fuel hurricanes. Warm air bloats with water vapor. The rising sea encroaches on the land. The consequences of tiny random acts echo throughout the world. I understand the physical world because at some level I understand the behavior of every small thing. I know how to assemble a coarse aggregate from the sum of multiple tiny motions. Individual molecules, water droplets, parcels of air, quanta of light, their random movements merge to yield a predictable and understandable whole. But physics is unable to explain the whole of the world in which I live. The planet teems with other people, seven billion plus fellow damaged creatures. We come together and break apart, seldom adding up to a coherent, predictable whole. I, she says, Kate, have lived a fortunate, charmed, loved life. This means I have infinite, gullible faith in the goodness of the individual. But I have none whatsoever in the collective. How else can it be that the sum total of so many tiny acts of kindness is a world inescapable of stopping something so uh, eminently stoppable? California burns. Islands and coastlines are smashed by hurricanes. At night, the stars are washed out by city lights, and the world is illuminated by the flickering ugliness of reality television. We burn coal and oil and gas heedless of the consequences. Our laws are changeable and shifting. The laws of physics are fixed. Change is already underway. Individual worries and sacrifices have not slowed it. Hope is a creature of privilege. We know that things will be lost, but it is comforting to believe that others will bear the brunt of it. We are the lucky ones who suffer little tragedies unmoored from the brutality of history. Our loved ones are taken from us by one through accident or illness, not wholesale by war or natural disaster, but the scale of climate change engulfs even the most fortunate. There is now no weather we haven't touched, no wilderness immune from our encroaching pressure. The world we once knew is never coming back. I have no hope that these changes can be reversed. We are inevitably sending our children to live on an unfamiliar planet. But the opposite of hope is not despair. It is grief. Even when resolving to limit the damage, we can mourn. And here the sheer scale of the, of the problem provides a perverse comfort. We are in this together. <sighs> I like that. The swiftness of the change, its scale and inevitability binds us into one. Broken hearts trapped together under a warming atmosphere. We need courage, not hope. Grief, after all, is the cost of being alive. 
We are all fated to live lives shot through with sadness and are not worth less for it. Courage is the resolve to do well without the assurance of a happy ending. Little molecules, random in their movement, add together to a coherent whole. Little lives do not. But here we are, together on a planet radiating evermore into space where there is no darkness, darkness, only light we cannot see. She's cool. Her writing is, I really, really like it. And I'm sure if I asked who by a raise of hands wants me to interview her, you probably all would like to. It's pretty poignant what she says about, you know, hope and uh as a climatologist, climate scientist, what she studies is, it, it just is, um, she sees more than we do as the lay people. I mean, we read all these articles and we talk amongst each other. And those of us that commentate, are commentators, we do these live streams. Uh, we watch each other. We watch scientists and we know, we do know. And as Vanessa and I talked about the other night when I did my uh, interview with Vanessa uh, Blakesley, which was wonderful, the prepping, you know, there's only so much prepping you can do for the unknown. I'm trying to look for the other article because it, 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 I just a little bit about it. The, the, um, at the end of it, you know, when she said we should never have called it Earth, she said to be a climate scientist is to be an active participant in a slow motion horror story. These are scary tales, t tales to tell children around the campfire. We are perfect, willfully naive victims. We were warned, and we did it anyway. Isn't she amazing? Her writing is great. I, um, she has kids. So she wrote this. What do I tell my son? A, a monster awaits in the deep, and someday it will come for you? We know this. We put it there. Kate made my day, and she did not depress me. Today, I'm not depressed. Today is a good day. It's hap I'm happy. It's beautiful out. You know, um, the weather has been maybe in the 70s with low humidity. I can't complain because what I read and what's happening in California, Redding and Oregon and fires and floods in Japan and everywhere else, how can I not be grateful for what is here? I mean, it is an absolutely beautiful day and I am absolutely Again, like she says, privileged, privileged in many ways. And so are a lot of you. So thank you for listening to me. Um, I'm going to contact Kate and hopefully we can have Kate come on with us because I think she would be just a fabulous interview. Uh, Dwayne said it's 100 in Portland today. Dry, dry, dry. Wow. My gosh. Patricia said it looks like a picture there. Yeah, I have to heal. She says enjoy and heal. Well, I, you know, it, it hit the six week mark and then all of a sudden the doctor says, okay, you know, neck brace for six weeks. And of course I did too much. I've had company. I go, I've done too many things. So I'm just trying to just keep myself. So I have to get better because I have things that have to be done around here and in life for whatever is it, it's worth, you know. Uh, we, we don't know. But again, when she says, oh, Mike says it's 102 and humid, Mike D in Austin. Mm. See, I am, I am one of the lucky ones, I guess, right now. I mean, we did have a week of 90s, but I didn't complain. <laughs> I really couldn't complain. <sighs> so we've got uh, Nicholas Humphreys with us on Monday. Monday uh, evening, I think, put it up, but he, he'll be live on Facebook. And if you want to come over to Facebook, because I don't do lives with interview guests yet on YouTube, but I'm working on it. Uh, have your questions for Nicholas Humphrey. He's a meteorologist. I've interviewed him before. He's got a lot of, uh, he's got a blog and he's really bright. He's very bright. If you're not familiar with him, watch the interview that I did with him uh, a couple of months ago. It was pretty good when a lot of the Arctic stuff was, well, it's heightened, it's starting, it's happening. I mean, it is. So it is what it is. And uh, again, I, I, I want to thank Vanessa for the interview. And um, Kim says, there's a dog locked in a car out in our parking lot going to yell, yell at the owner. Hmm. Well, here in New York, I think they passed a law that if it's, I think, a kid or an animal, you can break the window and not get arrested. So because people are stupid, ignorant morons, but... 
you know, there you go. That there's my being, uh, uh, um, I'm being, um, I mean, you know, we know what people are. We do. So anyway, thank you. Have a wonderful day. And think about that grief and hold on to it. I said before, work through all those stages for what we're, we have and what we're losing and what we know. And you come out the other side. And it's not hope, but it is, it is the knowledge that you have to keep doing things to, to, again, I keep saying it, better your own environment. You know, she's a climate scientist. And she says that she's lost some of those positive uh, feelings she has, but she doesn't say hope. Peace, everybody. Have a wonderful day, and thank you for coming. Bye. See you Monday. Oh, my goodness. Always got to do this with the finger.